With Halloween here, it's good to get back to my roots, I would say, with the spooky and the weird. Now for some, this time of the year, it's Sarwin, which is celebrating the ancestors who came before, and also venerating and honouring those who would not make it through the traditional winter. It's a grand feast and festivities for all welcome. Some see it as the beginning of a new cycle, even a new year, and others look forward to All Saints Day just the day after, while others turn off the lights and pretend not to be home, they do not wish to have ghosts come knocking at the door. It really is an ever-evolving celebration, and one that's fascinating for so many. But today and tonight we're going to go into something a little bit darker. We're going to go into the world of the occult. The occult circles of the rich and the famous. Now you might think that's a bit of a cop-out title, don't you think? But actually this is uh, partly inspired by my friend Alexandra Holtz's article that was published in Vice this past month, where she goes into celebrities who are allegedly haunted by ghosts. Of which there will be a link in the description below, and I do recommend you have a look at after you listen to my show here. Now this, my article was actually a bit broader in scope, and in video, of course, what I'm producing today. Now I'm producing the one here, this was actually authored in 2014, for an episode of The Rabbit Hole That Is Reality, episode 12. And for all good things that require a visit, it's a great time also to add and expand to that original feature. So this is our Halloween special, so feel free to stick around. And uh, try not to get too scared. Stars who say they are being possessed deal with spirits, ghosts, demons. Now, there are some who would say and argue quite rightly that they are just acting. Performance artists doing a role, because one of the first lessons at acting school, of course, is you know, take on a different personality and how to expand upon that. Now, artists are basically popular eccentrics. The esoteric goes hand in hand with eccentricity. Esoteric means hidden knowledge. It's basically a pre-modern understanding of the usage of psychology and social engineering. And I think it goes hand in hand with this because I feel that they've been directed and being told what to do, what to wear, what to say, how to act. And it lends itself very much close to the notion there is some kind of a colic, a colic, a cabalic movement of the occult going on in the media. Though whilst I do not personally believe there is uh, these people who are possessed, um, I do feel they're being told to say this for shock value. However, it's when, when you link what their actions are and what they say, you think, is this a window perhaps? Um, it's always going on behind the curtains of the world of the media. Now, current attention will drive yourself towards Miley Cyrus. Interesting little character, interesting little cat. She is... Well, her personality is, is split, literally. <laughs> so, if we go back in terms of, say, Miley Cyrus, she once, of course, was Hannah Montana, who, of course, had a split personality, or a split character, shall we say. And this is down to a duality, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So, whether she's twerking and jerking on stage, acting like some kind of perverted lizard, or running around bare-chested with her boobs hanging out, a chest waving about with a huge strap on dildo with devil horns on. You know, um, I think it's for attention. You know, and, uh, why else would you be making such like graphic um, uh, output? You know, but then you look at the press that's on her. It's like they garnered exactly what they were after. They wanted her back in the news, wanted her back in the magazines, and people talking about her again. And that's the power. It's the power that they, she, she is in the public conscious, and people are talking about. Her. That's the power. Now. Suffice to say, in an interview with Rolling Stone magazine, uh, Miley spoke quite open about her heavy use of drugs such as cocaine and hallucinogenics. And it's been joked for some time, and certainly spoken about in the circles that who talk about such things, that Hannah Montana is literally a manifestation of magic, uh, where she's a normal girl during the day, and of course that she's this very overt superstar during the night. She has a duality of personality, and that is very highly linked into the world of the esoteric. Now, South Park famously, quite famously, um, poked fun at this a number of years ago. And I think it's an episode, I think it's called A Star to Fall, I think. And it's basically, it's to, it's to fulfil a prophecy um, about not letting the world come to destruction. 
So Britney Spears, uh, basically she's on the run from Hollywood. She's had a failed suicide attempt because they can't use her face, so they, they kind of shut her face off. Um, so she went to uh, went to South Park in order to um, be saved and to get away from Hollywood and the cabal that's after her. And of course she's then helped by Stan, Carl, Kelly and Eric and Butters. Now all the townsfolk know of the prophecy and, uh, and who are in on the secret that she is... Her sacrifice has to happen in order for the world to be saved. And uh, so eventually they do, she is killed and she's sacrificed eventually. But at the end, there's something else that happens I think is more and more interesting. Is that I think uh, Trey Parker and Metzler absolutely nailed it on the head when they says, The world is safe until next time. Who will be next? Which is said by like Randy. And there's this poster of Miley Cyrus that appears over the credits and fades to black. And here we are, what, some eight years later, and that appears to be actually the case <laughs> and the direction she went down. So, Britney Spears. Now, this, of course, is an interesting character. She is, like, up there with the ones that are just a little bit quirky. Shaving head and all. So, Britney has actually spoken many times over the years of having different characters who take over her. She's actually said this. And, um, and then she becomes herself again. Now, of which, then, she has no memory of the former actions. So, are we talking about split personality disorder here? So, the Celebrity Justice magazine, uh, a, a rag mag celebrity gossip mag, uh, on the 17th of the 1st, 2008, is the source. Uh, it speaks about this. So, it's a very disturbing picture of Britney Spears, however happens to be on any given day, on any given moment. We've all been told the British accent thing. Um, well, it appears to be more than that. Britney fully engages in a different identity, multiple personality, including that of jo not just the British girl. And we're also told that when Britney loses the British personality, she has no idea of what she did during the time that she had assumed that personality. The sources tell us that Britney, Britney has had a number of other identities, including a weeping little girl, a diva, an incoherent girl who doesn't speak English, and others. And there's an infamous video that you can go watch on YouTube, but again, I'll link it below, where she's being interviewed in quite a solemn mood. She's talking about our actions of late, getting back on the ball, you know, recovering, and obviously moving forward back forward with their music career. And all of a sudden, it, look, it looks like, it looks like, that someone invisible nudges into her from the side. And then she says, oh, hello, as if to acknowledge them. And then she suddenly becomes this bubbly, bouncy, very Hollywood kind of a valley chick. Very diff, very strange. Um, so is this like kind of like depersonalization, a disassociative disorder, uh, likely brought around by drug use, which she has admitted to she has admitted to have been on large amounts of prescription drugs? Now, there's a few others who claim to have um, to be possessed. Beyonce is one of them. Beyonce claims that she, something possesses her when she's on stage. And if it wasn't for this spirit that actually has a name, it's called Sasha Fierce, that she would not be able to perform in the way that she does. And quoted as saying, as when Sasha is here, uh, I'm not aware of my face, I'm not aware of my body, she's taken over. Now, as she surrounds herself with magical symbol reads, certainly that of the occult, her videos all contain esoteric images. As she, for instance, is wearing the Ring of Baphomet, uh, the Super Bowl performance is frequently referenced as a very occult ritual. Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, you know, famous guy. Um, in an interview, is quoted as saying that he sold his soul to the, the one who cannot be seen. And when in the interview, uh, again, there's no indication this is a metaphor of any kind. He's speaking very openly, very calm. His demeanor is very serious when he's talking about this. Whatever he means by, I've sold my soul to the, the one who cannot be seen, it's very real to him. Very real indeed. And pop stars build a certain public sentiment, culture. Uh, far more than world leaders at this point, and I guess pop stars have spent the last 30 years becoming hypersexualized, hyper materialistic, which has had a quite profound effect on the American and world through thought patterns. Politicians have fought this and have tried to take on this unsuccessfully. Now let's talk about a few other characters as well within this uh, in this realm. Nicki Minaj, who says that she has a controller called Roman, who is a little boy who is full of rage and is violent, and that people quote conjured him up and then put him inside of me. Lady Gaga talks about the fusion of different realms. Her mission is to tell the world that magic is not artificial, that it is real. That's really quite freaky, because um, she's actually she's there's a law case going against her. That, bear in mind, when I wrote this, it was 2014. I'm not sure whether that's finished, but I'll talk about it here. Um, so, she had a female assistant from one of her tours, actually when she, I believe she was in England. And uh, who was made to sleep in the same room as Lady Gaga. Um, and this rang true. The interview I watched, uh, which I did see back at the time, um, she was on a live show. Uh, when she went back to her room after the show had finished, she told this person very, 
very strongly that someone was coming for her, just wanted to stay with her, and she couldn't tell. When she replied who it was, she says, I can't talk about them. Ghosts, is what she eventually said. And his name is Ryan. As a Ryan is a particular ghost who's after her. He annoys her during the night and he is a threat to her. Quote, uh, she actually held a seance in Ireland uh, at her monster ball tour of 2014 um, in an attempt to see him see it through and to get him gone. This ghost is clearly um, it's attached to her and it, she feels that it's doing something psychologically damaging to her. She contacted a spiritual medium and to organise a seance so she could communicate with him and tell him to go away. Again, this is quote. Um, she gathered all her friends in the weekend at, uh, in Belfast and held a seance to find out what he wants. She convinced that she's picked up a bad omen, who this character is, and although most of her friends are sceptical to this, they agreed to take part. It was previously revealed also that Lady Gaga, age 24 at the time, now 26, of course it was two years later, um, has spent thousands of pounds, or thousands of dollars even, on Ghostbusters, um, and splashed up $47,000 on a state-of-the-art electromagnetic field meter uh, around her house to detect spectres. She firmly believes in paranormal activity and won't take any risks when she's on the road. It's important for her to stay safe from spirits. They haunt her. Take from that what you will. Uh, Keisha. Keisha, quite a famous um, singer. Uh, anyone who's checked out the video I'm Gonna Die Young will certainly be fully aware of esoteric symbolism throughout that entire video. It's quite, fu quite fucked up, actually. It's quite a nice, pleasant beat, but that's because you kind of get into it. It's that same, like, four-beat of the heart, um, you know, you start going into other symbols there, but I'm not, we're not going to go into that stuff. But Keisha has actually made it stated that she was forced to have sex with a ghost. And that the song Die Young, which is what we just spoke about, uh, she did not want to sing the lyrics. And interestingly, there's a, in the Keisha case, there's, there's a very dark tone around her situation. And that involves her manager, Dr. Duke. Uh, his real name is, is Gottwald. He's a famous music producer in LA. And uh, Keisha said... Uh, that, well, actually, in 2014, she went to a rehab, went to a rehabilitation centre where she was suffering with severe depression, post-traumatic stress, and panic attacks. This is due to the fact that um, Keisha was making allegations of sexual abuse and rape of, by Dr. Duke, and it was during this time that she made the extraordinary claim above. Did that? As it stands, there's multiple back and forth um, U.S. legal proceedings. The detail here far too many, in fact. Um, however. To note, so on October the 14th, 2014, um, they filed a lawsuit that Miss Duke, some Dr. Duke, uh, abused Miss Selma, her real name, in order to destroy her self confidence, her self image, and self worth, so he could maintain complete control over her life and career, the lawsuit stated. Now, Dr. Duke is an interesting character, he's a Jewish chap, and he holds managerial positions over a number of other world class performers. And these include. Um, he basically, when it comes to managerial, what I mean by that is he looks after the character, the performance, the music, uh, the videos, and the intention of a producer. These include Jay-Z, uh, Katy Perry, check out that extraterrestrial video, uh, Britney Spears, Miley Cyrus, uh, and the two I'm about to mention, one of which is Jessie J, where if you just have to check out her videos, her cult symbol really is very, very heavy within those videos, which only stir controversy of the subject, although she personally denies any knowledge of the occultism and the terms within. As does Rihanna, who uh, declares herself to be the princess of the Illuminati, and her videos and actions are full of arcane symbolry of the mysteries, acknowledging herself as one with the pyramid in many pictures, the Harim Abif, the tile also known to Osiris, amongst many other names in esoteric lore. Now tracks such as Umbrella, with the symbolry in that should not be understated. It's very clear and apparent, albeit hidden. Let you know what it is, what you're looking at. Her song Disturbia, where she and her dancers are, they become possessed. In fact, some of the lyrics are quite interesting. I did actually write them down, particularly for this video here. Uh, it's a thief in the night to come and grab you. It can creep up inside you and consume you. A disease of the mind, it can control you. And it's too close for comfort. A disease of the mind, in a reference, of course, to possession. Now these times, now so other times, she actually made another video called Russian Roulette, where it shows her getting killed in various different ways, where uh, the lyrics actually encourage suicide. Um, I mention her a bit more, I, again, I mention her because I state that these are people who claim um, to be possessed, or claim to have spirits, or claim to have ghosts and demons and stuff. When I say that, she's obviously not claiming it there, um, but she did state in the January of 2012, fuck you Satan, fuck you right off, onto Twitter. 
Now, was this a declaration of literal meaning, or did she? Just, who was she talking to there? Because very out of can, all of her, all of her messages on Twitter are all very much uh, all pictures of her time touring, of her dates, her fo photos that she's posing the fans and stuff. This one is completely, utterly different. Is, is she in a rage mode? Or she, fuck you, Satan. I don't know. Okay. So this is a possession that's not rue, not, not rue, not real. Okay, Mr. Phone, be quiet. So there are there are some. And there are some, I've, I've had a good read of these now, who claim that Heath Ledger was actually possessed when he did the outstanding role of the Joker in The Dark Knight. Hmm. So, so this allegedly came from Bob Larson, a name who already you might be familiar with, or maybe not. So this is also a formally trending interview, of which there's two versions of. Now this comes from Bob, who possibly is the world's most famous or infamous exorcist, in an interview with MovieWeb in regards to Bob's role on the film The Devil Inside. And the question was asked in regards to Heath Ledger and The Dark Knight. So this, this is a quote, this is from the, uh, the guy interviewing from MovieWeb. Let's go back to Heath Ledger. It's your professional opinion, as the world's most renowned exorcist, that Heath Ledger was in fact possessed by a demon during the making of The Dark Knight that propelled his performance as the Joker. And now take from that as you will. Bob Larson instantly re replied with, I would say, something overtook that man. There's a strong possibility that somehow he just took too much of the evil of the character on. After all, whether it was psychological or spiritual, he would not draw that distinction anymore. It was not the first time that I've had an actor tell that sort of thing to me, as they were called to portray a role. Within this movie here, though, I do not see that happening. So Bob Larson there, despite his firm belief in possession and uh, exorcism, it would be quite easy for him to say, yes, there was a demon there, and continue the conspiracy that has come from this. However, he actually nipped it right in the bud there. Um, like he was saying, I don't see it happening there, it's not a case at all. Um, Ledger, as most people know, is actually a method actor. He takes a character on board, and withdrawing into the role completely. And the Joker is, of course, one hell of a fucked up character. Very messed up. So despite the Daily Express-like headline, um, that this was that this is not what he said. He clearly didn't say that. That was the quote. That's exactly as from the interview. So despite Bob not saying this, the movie web went ahead with the headline, Exclusive Heath Ledger was possessed during the Dark Knight, says Real Exorcist of the Devil Inside. Completely, completely avoiding the point that he actually said. He said that wasn't the case at all. So possessed pop stars, possessing pop stars, does not preclude them from influencing wealthy power makers and players either. There are those who want a hyper-realism, hyper-sexism, hyper-materialistic as well. Now, I don't discount the possibility that these symbols are used in their videos, are used in part of their marketing as an intent to subconsciously program the individuals into taking on board this information. But what exactly are these programs? And I believe that there's many experts who would claim to know these things. But I think you've got... There's lots of different layers here, isn't there? You get hints from the symbols, you get hints from the lyrics, the overall tone of the music and the production. I'm not sure it's easily decipherable. Assuming this is seriously going on in the music industry, that many claim it is. So, but we can be sure that between the lines of acting and promotional, are these people being honest and literal sometimes? I think there's definitely a dissociative identity disorder going on uh, with many of these. I think there's systemic abuse within the rigor of the work and the demands upon them. You see many people get into Hollywood, they go into the drugs, they go into like, potentially prostitution, they go into um, acts of depravity and so on. We've seen some of the things that have come out more recently, like uh, Elijah Wood has said, uh, the guy who's played Harry Potter, who's Daniel Radcliffe has said. Um, it, can, it can be a very dark place. And I guess you, when you have a certain circle of people who are, who are the key circle, who make things happen, the power makers, the power players, you know, who knows what they want to get up to, and what, what people do get up to. So this is the last case in point that I'm going to leave you with here tonight. As the presidential elections of the US are coming around, I believe it's the 2nd to the 9th of November, I'll leave you with this. So, we have four frontrunners in the, in the US presidential election. You have uh, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, Jill Stein and Greg Johnson representing their uh, respective parties. The two largest parties, of course, being the Republican and the Democrat, of which uh, Trump and Hillary are the two frontrunners of those two. Now, whilst it is my opinion that Hillary's actions are utterly deplorable, in the UK I do not have any meat or any steak going into the game. But, 
During her time as First Lady back in 1993, Bill Clinton, of course, was serving as President when she was First Lady, Hillary consulted the other world by the way of psychics. Now, Jean Houston was the director or co-director of the Foundation of Mind Research, which studies psychic experiences, altered and expanded consciousness, with her colleague Mary Catherine Bateson. Uh, now, uh, so Jean and, Jean and Mary, they got together several times over this period of time, over the first year of the Clinton administration, um, where they conducted seances and spoke to, allegedly, Eleanor Roosevelt and, indeed, Gandhi. A number of stories came out of that first year, um, of, that, of that administration, where Hillary confessed that she would, re would regularly communicate with Eleanor, and stories at the time were even labelled as seances. So that is the term we're using here. So not only did Hillary admit to talking to Eleanor, she also said that Eleanor talked back. So this admission clearly lies there's a two-way conversation. Although in more recent spin times, uh, there were not seances, they were just communication, they were just motivational talks, they were just embodiment messages. Uh, it was always just spin, and I guess if you're going towards the presidency to say that you talk to spirits, it's a little bit strange, I guess. But uh, as it stands, 1996, a book came out by uh, Bob Woodward called The Choice, where, and I quote, Miss Clinton met with Houston many times from late 94 to the March of this year, 1996, according to the book, um, that says Houston led the first lady through conversations with her hero, Miss Roosevelt, and Indian leader Gandhi. Miss Clinton was then engaged for several hours of conversations, for freewheeling discussions with Houston. Now, many countries' leaders, particularly, particularly the US, occultism is key and central. It is an integral part of the power they wield. Even if someone is perhaps putting the strings behind the scenes, this is our Halloween special. Strange and spookiness in regards to the stars who claim to engage and talk with and even are possessed by spirits, ghosts and demons, including of which, Hillary Clinton. Anyway, this is me signing off. I'll speak with you another time very soon. Mm -hmm.